that's the one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Andre. Um, I work with Oli, a couple of other people at the Iconic. I'm a senior software engineer there. Um, I'm from Germany originally. You might hear a little bit of an accent, maybe not. Um, and I'm ridiculously tired tonight, so apologies for that. Um, okay, so a couple of weeks ago, I started some research into how we can improve our uh, performance, our page load performance particularly, and particularly on mobile, because as you know, um, mobile is uh, gaining a lot more importance these days, um, and that's just going to increase and increase. Um, and to start with, I think we just have a look at what the a typical current situation is. Let's say you wanna, you sit on a train, you have your mobile out, and you wanna see when the next sit PHP meet meetup is happening and who is talking there. So you kind of enter this situation. Um, so as you saw, you're basically looking at a blank page for about five seconds. I'm pretty sure everyone's familiar with that situation, which is in stark contrast to what you see on the desktop uh, on your fancy wireless connection. Um, now, how would it be if, ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, just some, some uh, facts around that um, figure. So Google did a study a couple of years back uh, with a significantly large group of uh, users on mobiles, and uh, they interviewed them after their experience, and a lot of them said uh, they wouldn't come back to a site that takes longer than four seconds to show them anything. Um, the interesting thing here, I think, is that we always have this notion that users go away right away. That's not going to happen. They're just going to wait, experience the site once, and then just not going to come back. Um, and the kind of common uh, knowledge is that um, the attention span of people is rather short, and particularly on mobiles. And um, if you let them wait for longer than a second, they usually get distracted, and their mind goes somewhere else. And they might just forget that they were looking for their keys in their phone. Okay, so what would it be like if it would be like that instead? Wouldn't that be nice? Or maybe if we can't go there, we might just do that. In both cases, we have the user occupied after one second or even shorter. And if you can't show them the full page in that time frame, you might just want to keep them entertained. So how do we get there? Um, Let's have a look at the problem, the usual old uh, page speed problem, which consists of a few parts. So we've got server-side processing, um, your database access, linear processing, possibly slow PHP code that costs a bit of time on the server. Then we have the actual page load, so that's your network time, um, which is particularly bad on the mobile, of course, because A, it's slow, um, B, your connection breaks all the time without you even noticing. Um, then, of course, we have the uh, initial DOM parsing. Uh, assets need to be loaded. Uh, inline images need to be loaded. All that kind of stuff you're probably familiar with. Um, and lastly, um, usually the biggest chunk is rendering processing on the browser side. Um, yeah, going through your DOM, parsing your CSS, doing layout, parsing JavaScript. So what can you do about that? Of course, you can optimize your HTML, JavaScript, CSS, um, optimize your rendering, and maybe execute your JavaScript in selective execution paths. Um, on the server, uh, you're familiar with that. Scaling, caching, um, you can make smart platform choices, um, pick the best product for what you're trying to do, and you can optimize your PHP code, of course. Um, yeah, DOM parsing, same story. You, you know, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with that. Compact your assets, optimize images. Um, defer whatever you can defer and use caching. But what about page load? What can you do about that? So basically our naive notion is that network time is 
a simple equation, a rough equation of the amount of data that I need to send to the browser and the bandwidth that my connection gives me. Now, bandwidth connection on mobile in Australia is relatively good. Actually, uh, Telstra had the fastest 4G connection in the world for a couple of years, for the last two years or so. They just lost it to Spain. Um, so in this little graph here, you see the blue ones that are the advertised theoretical uh, maximum uh, bandwidth throughput rates. Uh, the red ones are the ones that are actually the in practice realistic ones that are actually happening. And that's still the maximum. And that little green line there indicates the coverage. So 4G is still only 60% of the time, even if you're a 4G customer. You connect to 4G only 60% of your time, and it falls back to 3G, which is covered about 80% of the time. And then a few times you still fall back to Edge or 2G. Um, sorry, bandwidth on those. Uh, so the, the realistic maximum on 3G is about 5 Mbit per second. Uh, on 4G, it's about 12 Mbit per second. So what does it mean for us? Uh, if we have a relatively complex page, it's about 30 kilobytes. That's already quite large. Uh, I'm mostly talking about the HTML only. Like, you all know how much assets take up on top of that. Um, usually HTML is a bit smaller, but this is like fairly decent complex page, can reach up to that. So on that 5 Mbit 3G connection, which is the most widely covered, that equates to about 600 kilobytes per second, and that means that 30 kilobyte page should be loaded in 0.05 seconds. Obviously, that's not happening. Even if we go down to the speed of the initial 3G connections, they were only 384 kilobits per second, which equates to about 47 kilobytes per second. Then your page st should still load in 0.65 seconds. So obviously this is not really explaining why we see a blank page for four seconds. So why is it? Because bandwidth basically only tells us how much data can go through the wire or the air uh, in one second. It's a, it's a measure of capacity, not really of speed. It doesn't tell us how fast the data travels, it just tells us how much we can dump in there and expect to come out at the other end. Uh, as opposed to that, there's something you probably heard of, round trip time. We kind of use it in everyday life without really thinking about it. Um, that actually tells us how long it takes for our data to travel. It tells us how long a single bit takes to go from the client to the server and come back to us. It is not included in the bandwidth metrics. Okay, and this is how the round trip time looks on mobile connections. For 2G, it is between 300 milliseconds and one second. So if you want to go and load that web page on a mobile in one second on a 2G connection, you're uh, you can give up hope. Um, <laughs> on 3G, a bit better, 200 to 300 seconds, uh, milliseconds. And on 4G, it's um, the still used common figure is about 50 to 100 milliseconds. I believe on the latest 4G connections, it's uh, quite a bit faster. Uh, finally, on the wire, you're looking at about 10 to 20 milliseconds. So out of that, um, the commonly used or accepted average at the moment, um, this is also a little bit old, but it's still, it's still the most commonly referred to uh, average is 200 milliseconds that you should expect for your request to go somewhere and you get a response. Cool. What does that mean for that little super fast mobile page we are trying to develop? Oops. Um, let me just add that. Cool. So the uh, our initial page request is not like I think as as PHP or as web developers we don't like to think that much about what's going on in the network, and that's kind of why I'm I'm giving this talk. 
um, because I found really interesting when I discovered all that. Um, so I think naively we kind of just think, hey, we send an HTTP request somewhere and we get something back and then we worry about the little um, waterfall graphs in, in our Chrome DevTools or whatever we are using. Um, what's actually happening is a lot more. So the first, on the first initial page request, um, of course you need to look up your domain name from a DNS server. So there's one request, 200 milliseconds gone. Uh, then you need to establish a TCP connection to that IP address that you got back from them. Um, that's a freeway handshake, but we only worry about two parts of that handshake. So that's another 200 milliseconds. And finally, we can send our HTTP request. And of course, we need to get a response, 200 milliseconds. So overall, we have just spent 600 milliseconds out of the one second that we want to use uh, to show the page. Um, if you do redirects during that process, say particularly if you do a redirect from your main site to a mobile site with an m dot prefix, that's a really bad idea these days because uh, you're wasting another couple of 600 milliseconds. Um, if you are redirecting to the same domain, um, you can shave off 400 of those because you don't need to do DNS lookup or establish a TCP connection because that one is cached, cached in the browser. So as I said, out of our one second budget, we have already used up 600 milliseconds. Um, next easy thing to look at, uh, we, don't, we can't load any assets. We can't do any further requests in our budget because we already know it's gonna take another 600 milliseconds. Puts us out of our budget, so we can forget about that. Um, we can we have about 100 to 200 milliseconds on the server side and 200 to 300 milliseconds on the client side. Depends on how you want to balance that. Uh, put it that way because server is usually a bit faster than client, particularly on a mobile, weak CPUs and all that. Okay, but it doesn't end there, it gets worse. worse. So we need to look a bit at the um, at the actual network layer here, or the, the network layers. So this is the uh, TCP IP model, which is in contrast to the OSI model that has seven layers. Uh, the TCP IP model simplifies a couple of things. Um, so it talks about an application layer. Um, that's basically our HTTP request. Um, underneath that sits the TCP layer that's responsible for the uh, data transfer. The IP layer, basically addressing and the data link layer, that's the one that, of course, handles all the stuff. That's the one responsible for uh, sending bits through some wire. Um, that lowest layer is the one that imposes the bandwidth and the round trip time because in that model, uh, it includes the hardware layer. So basically, every layer that sits above that suffers from these uh, restrictions. Uh, the one we want to look up in this case, uh, look at is in this case is the transport layer, the TCP layer. So TCP basically works uh, around this flow protocol. Um, if you file a request, you um, send a sequence of data packages to a receiver, and you are waiting for an acknowledgement that the receiver received those packages. If the acknowledgement is successful, it comes with the next sequence number of expected, um, the next expected data packages. Um, then the sender sends those packages again, uh, the next ones, um, and it might so happen that you are not getting a response back because the package got lost somewhere, or the whole sequence of packages. Um, in that case, the sender waits a little bit for an acknowledgement. If it doesn't come in, it just tries to send the package again, or the sequence of packages. Um, and if it's lucky, it suddenly gets a response, and it can continue. So the significance of that is that even though you're sending one HTTP request in the end out of these 200 milliseconds, that one HTTP request might actually not be taking up 200 milliseconds, because 
it might consist of several of these forth and backs between sending data and getting an acknowledgement response back. Um, yeah, let's just hold that thought and go to the next uh, protocol that TCP implements, which is congestion control. So what happens if, yeah, what happens if um, we, are, we are implementing this flow protocol and we are sending packages somewhere and we are waiting for an acknowledgement and it doesn't come in and then we send a package again and it doesn't come in again and we are sending a package again. Basically, we are spamming the network. And what happens is that some switch in between or some component of the network might just not be able to cope with these packages and might throw them away for a reason. It might still be busy routing other packages through, but our packages from our server uh, might just be rejected all the time and we're just sending them again and again, keeping that same switch busy. So that can lead to the case where the switch has no uh, chance to recover from the stress it's under. And this is called congestive collapse. It means too many packages get dumped into the network and get stuck there, and it's a, a dead end cycle, basically. So for that reason, TCP uh, implements a congestion control protocol, and that begins with something that got introduced a couple of years back called TCP slow start. What that means is when you file a request and you say you send uh, 50 kilobytes of data, in, you want to send that through the wire. It doesn't start with sending 50 kilobytes of data because that would be dangerous to the network because then it would have to send the 50, sen uh, 50 kilobytes of data again according to the flow control protocol. Um, <coughs> hence, it starts with a minimum amount which is set to 10 segments. Uh, I'll get to what a segment is in a second. Uh, if it gets a successful acknowledgement back during the TCP slow start phase, it does actually something that's pretty fast. It doubles the amount of data it dumps into the wire the next time. If it gets a, uh, if it doesn't get an acknowledgement or it gets a rejection or a failed, uh, uh, an error message back, um, it halves the amount of data it dumped in previously in the next uh, cycle. And that amount of data is called the congest congestion window. Um, once the there's a uh, there's a so-called slow start threshold. Once the amount of data reaches that threshold, it switches to a linear increase, which is really minimal. It's only adding one more segment per return trip. So that's why TCP slow start is kind of a bit of a confusing term because it's actually increasing much faster than during normal operation but it's called TCP slow start because it's avoiding uh, dumping a huge amount of data into the network to start with. Okay, so what does this look like? Um, let's look at these TCP segments. As I said, um, the current standard is 10 of them initially, and they are heavily depending on the network configuration on the lower layers. Um, so the, the maximum segment size can be anywhere between 536 and, uh, bytes and 64 kilobytes in theory. In practice, though, it depends on the MTU, which is the maximum transfer unit that is defined on the data link layer. This is negotiated by the operating system, but it basically depends, depends on your network card. And this number here, 1,500 bytes, is a pretty standard number. Um, it needs to shave space for its own headers of that and for the IP layer, the IP layer's header, which is still underneath. So we end up with 1,460 bytes for each of these segments. Um, yeah. yeah, and as I said, 10 of them will be dumped into the wire initially. That means for our first request, for our first round trip cycle, we have a budget of 14,600 uh, 14, bytes, which is, of course, 14 kilobytes, roughly. 
only if we don't exceed that on the response, we will stay within the 600 millisecond network budget. If we have the freedom to go a bit higher because of the doubling of the amount of data on the next step, if we can deal with 800 milliseconds, we have a budget of 44 kilobytes. So how do we get that page on the mobile in 14 kilobytes? Um, there's something implemented in HTTP 1.1. It's called chunk encoding, um, which is I find quite interesting, but you don't hear that much about it. Um, which basically allows us to send parts of the page much earlier than we need to and chunk up our load as we like. So to do that, we need to remove the content length header and we need to instead add a transfer encoding chunked header. And we need to disable gzip compression because the gzip compression sits above the HTTP layer, so the HTTP layer is not aware of it. So if we chunk up our HTTP uh, data, um, the browser has no way of decoding a partial gzip file, obviously. And um, you need to use PHP flush to f kind of try and force that uh, chunk to be sent out. Um, finally, uh, some PHP. So uh, one way of doing that is whatever, this is a pretty generic way of doing it that you can just chuck into any framework you're using. You just have to find the right place. It might be a response object or it might be uh, an event listener or something. Um, so usually your framework uh, will be caches your, um, your output. So you get that. Uh, you have to calculate the length, then you have to convert the length to uh, hexadecimal uh, representation, and you dump that in the first line followed by a CRLF. Um, and then you dump that particular content in the next line again followed by a CRLF. And then you flush the whole lot, which basically triggers your web server to try and send it out to the browser right away. And then you start the next buffer. Um, so you will do that after you're pretty sure that you required roughly 14 kilobytes to your to your content, and you send it out. And you need to keep in mind that it's not gzipped anymore, so uh, it's a bit bigger. Um, and finally, when you, uh, you can do that throughout your page at any stage you like, and at the very end you terminate the page with an empty chunk, which has a length of zero and an empty content line. So you can take this into, into consideration when designing your page. Um, we basically arrived at the notion that you have only one request to get something to that little mobile phone. Um, you need to be smart about what you are including there because it can only be 14 kilobytes, but it also shouldn't cause you so much processing time on the browser that you're exceeding your 200 to 300 millisecond processing budget there. Um, this approach will help you with the processing time on the server because you can send stuff out much earlier. And you can, for instance, then start loading uh, external assets while your server is actually still processing the page. Um, yeah, so you basically include here what you need. Okay. And that's it for uh, HTTP 1.1. Um, HTTP 2 solves all these problems in one go. Uh, it has a single connection. Um, it allows you to, uh, so it multiplexes the connection, um, which means it cuts down the connection establishment overhead. Like um, you only need to establish one connection to your server. You don't need to establish another connection for your assets. You can just go through the same. Uh, so you have like at least 200 millisecond gain there, maybe 400. Um, because, yeah, you, you're not, you don't need to go to the uh, connection establishment phase. Um, it, chunk, it chunks the transfer itself and each frame is compressed. So it kind of gives you the best of the chunk uh, encoding and the uh, gzipped compression. 
Uh, it also allows you to do server-side push, which means you don't even have to send a second request if you need assets. You can just, if your ser server knows that the client will need a certain style sheet or a bit of JavaScript, it can just push it out straight away after the initial page. And finally, it has header compression, which makes the whole thing a little bit, um, a little bit smaller as well. And that's it for me. Yeah, so I, I skipped Speedy. Uh, we looked into Speedy first, um, but basically, as you can tell, it's uh, pretty close to uh, being, being stabilized and finalized. Um, so Speedy is essentially the same, but I think HTTP2 has a few more like that whole framing, um, chucking up the, the request in, into frames, and, and encrypting those that um, is much more mature than, than what Speedy was doing. Um, there's no way to gzip compress each chunk before sending it out to overcome that? Um, so, natively, no, because you're sending a... It's like, think about a zip file, and you're just arbitrarily cutting a piece out of it. How do you decode it? Like, you can't decompress it. So the browser is basically in the same situation. There is a solution to that, um, which is you can include a bit of JavaScript that does the decrypting you well, not decrypting, but the uh, deflating. Yeah, so you could do that, um, but then you have to weigh the, the benefit of including that extra JavaScript, the extra processing time, against um, the benefit of your compression ratio. Is there an existing library for that, or is it something you should just do yourself? Um, there's definitely people who have done it, so um, I wouldn't say a library, it's more like you find scripts online. Yeah blog articles and stuff. Okay. There's people that have played with that. Can, can you talk about the uh, HTTPS? I mean, SSL lay layers, uh, how, how is this layer independent uh, from, from TCP and uh, from uh, the R cloud transport layer? Okay. Um, it's basically not a separate layer. It's the HTTP layer. Um, it's just a protocol extension, so to speak, um, that adds encryption to the HTTP transfer protocol. But, but uh, I hear it's, uh, it's still handshaking, uh, have some, some, some yeah. things before, before yeah. that. So, so HTTPS has, of course, an SSL handshake overhead, which um, I'm actually not too familiar with about the, the internal details okay. of that. I'm not sure if that causes another <laughs> request or not. Um, so yeah. It's about three and a half times worse than your standard. Yeah. yeah, it is definitely slower, plus you have um, the encryption overhead, which is also make, making it slower. Um, but if you, for instance, uh, Google set up a really nice uh, test page for Speedy, which is basically utilizing, like was the first thing I've utilized that utilized and, and tried to, uh, try to demo, that that trade-off uh, is actually not that significant. Um, and that demo page was quite impressive in terms of the speed. Like, um, yeah, because uh, if it particularly plays in once you start loading your assets, like once you um, on on a single request, you probably won't have any benefit. You're probably trading off. You're, you're losing performance. But if you want to load um, further assets, uh, the more requests you have, the more it gives you. Um, yeah, just through that multiplexing nature, because the SSL handshake over only happens once then and you don't have any other connection negotiations anymore during, during the, the process. Yeah. Um, the 14K comes from 10 segments, right? Yeah. And so is that what the web browser will be sending back in one go? So this is what your server sends back. So the web browser request is relatively small. It definitely fits in that button, unless you have massive cookies in your headers or something. Um, so this is more like about the so the browser sends the request, right? And then the server responds, say, with more than 14 kilobytes. Like, say you have a page that has 30 kilobytes. Um, then your f the first response doesn't actually contain the 30 kilobytes. It contains 14 kilobytes. If you're lucky, that gets through, gets acknowledged, and then the next chunk 
get sent. Um, and the, the, the good thing about, like, this is not just about the number of requests, but it's also on a mobile, you have intermittent connection. You never know when it breaks up. So being really conscious, like, even if you don't want to go there and try to go there within one second and, and um, stay within that 14 kilobyte budget, it's still good to be conscious about these, um, how that segmenting works, that you have, like, 14 in one and then another about 30, 28 in the next one. So that whenever an error occurs in the connection, if you only have one response, it's great because that either comes through or not. And the risk of the connection breaking up in that process is much lower than if you have like three or four uh, response packages or sequences. Okay. That makes sense. And the slow start, is it still 10? It's not 10. It's still 10. So that was actually only increased recently. Uh, Google lobbied a lot for, it was four kilobytes for ages, four segments. Um, and then Google lobbied a lot to raise it to 10. Um, there was concerns like um, this stuff has to be negotiated because uh, of course the network hardware, this is all tailored to the network hardware that is widely spread. So if the notion is that it can't handle being spanned by 10 segments all the time, then starting with segments, uh, 10 segments is not a good idea. Yeah. I have a comment I want to make. Um, with post requests, I believe that we do a post request, you have to specify the option to send them all in one go, because I believe post requests require a separate acknowledgement if it's beyond a certain size. There was a name for that, I just can't remember it. Like an HTTP post request? Yes. Uh, that's independent. I just so know there's, there's two, there's, in the protocol, there's one where you can send the entire request out, like in one go, and then there's another one where you have to wait for the server to acknowledge before you send all the post data. Okay. Oh, we um, don't have an interaction with this because of the you know size of post data. Like I would say, it just come back to me. If your post request would be under 14k, then I'd specify the option to send it out immediately rather than waiting for the server to request and have them input. The thing is that this, so what you're talking about is uh, on the HTTP layer. Yeah. So that, I, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Um, but this, um, this 14 kilobyte window is one layer underneath. The HTTP layer is not aware of that at all. It happens to every request, like if it's post or get or whatever. Um, but it would fit in. It is a layer above, but it still would have to fit in to be... If it fits in, it fits in. <laughs> yeah, just the, there's an extra acknowledgement required by default with post requests. Like you say, I'm about to post, the service says, okay, post, and then you post. And if you specify the is that, is that the option request you're talking about? Um, I'll, I'll just put you fine. <laughs> but I'm not encyclopedia, but I just remember it. Yeah. So there's a, on that on that note, uh, just a sec. Like there's like a, if you do APIs, there's a common practice to send an option request first, confirm that you're allowed and and able to send whatever method you want to use. So that's another concern there because again, you're multiplying your requests. Uh, sorry, need uh, that again. Uh, what do you use on using uh, on the uh, additional DNS handshake requests between using a uh, CDN to deliver assets or cross-site requests? Okay, so the, the CDN is the um, just an IP address that needs to be resolved, right? So the CDN serves your assets much faster because um, they're somewhere near you. Um, it has much more capacity probably. Um, but the DNS that needs to be that needs to be resolved. Now there's a there's a lot of different things you can do. Like this is an area that I didn't really want to cover. Um, browsers can reuse the same connection for between two and six requests. So if you have two and six requests, uh, uh, no, sorry, this is wrong. It can have <laughs> uh, browsers can have between two and six con connections open in parallel. Um, after that, they shut it down because, again, there's the concern of network spam. Um, now, they also reuse the connection. So once you request an asset through one uh, domain of your CDM, your next asset that comes after that will reuse that connection. So that's great. You don't need to look up DNS again. You don't need to establish a connection. 
connection keeps open and, uh, so long as it's used. Um, now there's a trade-off with that, and because those assets have to wait, the connection is free. Um, now to avoid that, you can uh, spawn connections, right? Use different domain names. Sorry, I did tell this the wrong way. This sex con <laughs> okay, it is six connections to the same server that can be opened in parallel. Uh, the server is determined by domain name, so if you want to fool the browser, you just change the domain name. Like prefix is, prefix is with A and B and C, it's called domain sharding. Um, and then send, so you get like 12 and then 18 and so on. Um, Trade off, more DNS and connection overhead. Is that answering your question? Yeah, no, I was just I was um, wondering the your view on optimizing when you should do that for the view of time and then you have a certain It depends on the case. I think there's no no formula for that. Like a, a lot of I think a lot of performance workers try and error in trying to find out like what your particular case is. Yeah. I've um, I've also just put a link up about DNS performance testing as well as it leads me close to that one non link um, behind automatic WordPress app that did some of this racism and stuff. More reading material if you're curious. Um, also, on the DNS node, uh, mobile devices cache DNS lookups uh, for quite a long time. Actually, I have the notion. I don't. I didn't confirm that thoroughly, but I got that notion by reading through some uh, articles. Yeah. You can also use DNS prefetch headers in your HTML, which we do. We also um, domain shard our settings, but that's targeted at a desktop and probably should be different in a mobile world, but it's not for us. Um, just quickly though, uh, in practice, do mobile networks actually use a 1500 byte MTU? Do you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. From what I from what I could research, yes. Um, yeah, I tried to uh, get it, get a specific number on there, and this is what I, uh, the notion yeah. I got. Yeah. The rest of the internet does, I mean, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. 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 Um, so the head is called expect 100 continue. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, uh, so that's definitely on the HTTP layer, and, and it, it's, that's totally unaware of what happens underneath, and that's so what avoid, happens underneath. To avoid the delay, to avoid having to do an extra round trip on both sides. If you fit your data within port NK in a post request and disable expect 100 continue, you'll save one round trip. Yeah, you will save that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, any more questions? <laughs>